You've got your weekly dose of uh, material. And is there anyone who is confused about what you're supposed to have at the moment? You have all the lectures up to and including the lectures that are being given this evening. And you have the workbook up to the end of the unfilled in forms. This evening you got one extra thing which is an amortization schedule that Pat Drozdowski may be speaking about a little bit later on. You will recall that the date of closing of these two deals is the 17th of March. The date of requisitions, one of them I recall we had a 10-day requisition that took us to February 21. So those requisitions are overdue by now. You had ad additionally uh, last week in connection with the Tony Peckham's lecture an added page 80A and a page H17. If you just want to check, make sure you've got those. Those were the added letters dealing with the residential rent review. Your table of contents is now ready to be prepared and so next week you will get your table of contents and I think you'll find it helpful. The front part of your book is the lecture part, the back part of your book is the workbook part. Your green sheet, the evaluation sheet, we'd ask you to fill in as you go along and we'll accept them from you next week when you're finished with your evaluation. As far as the lecturers are concerned, um, the one comment which always makes me sad is that someone objects to the lecturer reading the lecture. I'm so glad to have the quality of people that we've got that I don't mind if they read their lectures because these aren't stand-up comics, these are working lawyers and it may be that uh, the stand-up stuff is not their stock and trade. Though at the moment I don't think we have any cause for complaint, they've all been super. A couple of you have asked, when are we getting to the part on HUDAC? We had it with Brenda Duncan. And when are we getting to the part on condominium? That, as well as certain other topics, is going to be a separate uh, course or a separate seminar. HUDAC is actually coming up in uh, two weeks, I think it is, the 14th of March. Your comments, some of you have already uh, put in your evaluation, and your comments have already been most helpful, and thank you very much for them. It is going to be helpful to see what it is that uh, those of you who are paying the shot want to get. I was interested in two of the comments. As I pull my little blue sheet, I see Back to Basics, a refresher course in real estate. And one of the comments, it didn't indicate that it was a negative comment, it was just, it was this kind of a comment, I find this course rather basic. And the second comment was, this seems to deal in residential real estate. And I thought, well, I guess we're hitting something right. That's exactly what we were trying to do. How many of you would be willing to let us know whether you've used any of the materials so far in three areas? Have any of you done anything with your card index systems? Nobody's made any change because of what they heard on card index. What about your tickler systems? Anybody done anything with the tickler system? Couple. And how about the general uh, precedents for the letter, form letters and things like that? Anybody used those yet? Okay. <laughs> that seems to be our big winner because I've used them too. Now tonight I brought you some of you had asked, what's strung across the front here before my laundry falls down, is the county and district maps. The farthest one, that's to your left, is what maps they have. The middle one, which is green, is where you can get them and their price. The third one over that is colored is their litho, and it is usually on, um, it shows more in the same space. And the one that's closest to me is one which uh, shows in fairly large detail. You can, if you do come up and check that one, you'll see that it shows road allowances. It shows unopened road allowances. It shows where they should be and little broken lines for forced roads and things like that. And I have one further thing to bring us from last week. One of you asked Tony, if hydro arrears are a lien under Section 30 of the Public Utilities Act and may be collected in a like manner as municipal taxes, does the lien enjoy the priority provision of Section 511 of the Municipal Act? That's a beautiful question. And Tony's given us the answer. And I'm reading from his letter. It would appear that before 1979, the lien did not enjoy the priority of taxes under Section 511 of the Municipal Act, even though it was added to the tax roll. 
The decision of Guarantee Trust Company of Canada and Quality Steels, 1953 decision, upheld this position. However, by 1979 statutes of Ontario, the Public Utilities Act was amended and Section 31 now provides, quote, the amount is a lien and charge upon the lands in the same manner and to the same extent as municipal taxes upon the land. Therefore, it's Tony's opinion that the lien for hydro arrears enjoys it's the same priority as municipal taxes. And what the heck, it's only one more. We've already got 200 to worry about. This, for those of you who are going to be following this evening by filling in, this is the land titles procedural guide, which is uh, prepared with your money and you can obtain it for another $3 from Her Majesty's bookstore. It's the, make sure you get the second volume, October of 1979. Land titles complained that the reason we had such delay in land titles is because our documents were not properly prepared. And we said, okay, tell us what it is you want on the documents. And five years later, we got her. And they do update it. Now, one other thing that I would like to draw to your attention in connection, just in connection with your general practice, is the Mornish case, which you will recall in the Court of Appeal, uh, dealt with the question of deemed reinvestment of interest paid on a mortgage has been overruled by the Supreme Court of Canada. January 27, the decision came down and it overruled the trial one. One further thing, I showed you the red booklets dealing with condominium. They've been superseded by this little fellow which is called Condominium, what it's all about. I'm indebted to one of our participants for giving me this copy. You can get it from Condominium Ontario, Eglinton. It's 44 Eglinton Avenue West. Now, just before we get into our evening's uh, program here, there's one thing that I would like to mention. Because our speakers are not, or under ordinary circumstances, professional speakers, it is distracting if we do hear comment from the floor. If you have a question, please write it, and uh, we'll try and answer it. If you do have something really exciting you want to tell your neighbor, either go to the back or say it quickly and quietly, if you wouldn't mind. And that brings us uh, into our, the question of our speakers. As I told you, our speakers come from small firms, large firms, in town, out of town, and tonight we've sort of got everything. Tonight we have, we're going to start with Robert Cohen on the topic of the requisitions, and that takes care of the title search that we had last week and the comments that Rick Angelson made, and perhaps some of the comments that Tony made too. And Bob is a partner in a firm which is large, medium, or medium-large, depending how you uh, look at it. And since his call to the bar in 1972, his emphasis has been in real estate law. And uh, he tells me he's married with two children who often suggest to him with regard to his many requisitions that he satisfy himself. Bob? <clears throat> Thank you, Miriam. As Miriam already indicated uh, in her remarks, some of you have uh, said to her that the course is very basic and when submitting my lecture, I called to apologize for preparing a very basic lecture on requisitions and their answers. Uh, Miriam reminded me, as she's reminded you today, that the course was entitled Back to Basics and this was therefore to be the main thrust of my presentations. Uh, I understand that the course organizers were originally expecting a uh, seminar group size of enrollment, uh, but obviously by the numbers uh, enrolled and present here tonight, uh, there seems to be some need for this type of basic course, or a lot of you have nothing better to do with your early Wednesday evenings. Uh, before proceeding further, uh, I should apologize to anyone in this room uh, with whom I have not practiced what I preach. If my requisition letters to you have uh, been less than perfect models, I apologize, you got me on a bad day. Uh, what we are aiming for, however, uh, in these lectures is upgrading our standard of practice. Uh, often, however, the practicalities of practice require us to make certain compromise uh, when your conveyancer brings you the search of title at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and it's up to you to read, review and requisition and have your requisitions delivered uh, by that evening, the form often goes by the boards. I'd like to turn now to my lecture.
I'll be reading part of it. Miriam did the groundwork for me. She said that I could. Uh, and I'll be adding to it in parts as well. The first paragraph uh, deals with sources of requisitions, and I think it's obvious to all of us that the source of requisitioning comes from the agreement of purchase and sale. Uh, you all see it, you all deal with it on a regular basis, and I think you're familiar with its terms. The key element in requisitioning appears to be the time, the time of requisitioning. Many of you have perhaps attended uh, these lectures having to do with uh, some of the solicitor's negligence problems, and we've all been told that negligence in many cases doesn't arise from a lack of knowledge. It arises from a lack of proper office procedures. One of the proper office procedures that we should all be following carefully is the requisition date. When an agreement of purchase and sale comes into me, if I'm lucky enough to be in time to requisition, I make a very careful point of diarizing a number of dates. The requisition date itself must, of course, be diarized. And as I've indicated to you in my lecture, I diarize at least a week before the requisition date as well to make certain that I can follow up on my conveyancers and they can bring me the requisitions in time, or rather the search itself in time, so that I can review and requisition uh, with some degree of comfort in some time. What I get into is the question of extending requisitions. It's a great comfort to us uh, to believe that perhaps we have almost a right to extend requisitions, but I'm suggesting to you in my lecture that it's not nearly that at all. Uh, in my opinion, we as solicitors have no right to make requisition extensions. Uh, you're giving away certain of your client's position. You can't do that without his instructions. When you get these instructions, you go to your client, you say the solicitor has uh, requested an extension of requisitions, and then he wants to know what are requisitions. What's it all about? He has no idea of what you're doing. What it comes down to, down to is he'll ask your advice. Should I give away something? Should I give away my position? Sometimes it's prudent for you to advise him to give away some of his position. If the deal is a rocky deal to begin with, and you're trying to hold the pieces together by being unnecessarily hard on the other side by not granting him a two-day, three-day requisition extension. Uh, it may just be that final nail in the coffin of the transaction. So occasionally, you will advise your client to extend requisitions. But this is a decision that's made with your client. When the letter or when the requisitions are extended, be sure to confirm the extension date. Uh, the obvious place to confirm the extension date is perhaps in the letter of requisitions itself. Before actually going into the requisition letter, you can first confirm the agreement of the other side on a particular date uh, that requisitions have been extended. Uh, if requisitions have been extended for some considerable time and that letter won't be forthcoming for some time, I believe there's an example letter in the materials on uh, workbook uh, page 101 giving you some idea of the wording that you should be using for extending your letter of requisitions. What I get into at, at some great length is the form and style of requisitions and the requisition letter itself. Some of you uh, may recall from law school days discussion uh, as to uh, differences between requisitions that go to the root of title, requisitions on contract, requisitions on conveyancing. Uh, if your memory is like mine, uh, these type, th this type of instruction came very, back to me very foggily. I never remembered from my instruction the differences, and I, I think I've come to realize that one of the reasons that I don't remember the differences is that they were never very precisely defined. They haven't been defined in lecture, they haven't been defined in case law. Uh, some matters are obvious requisitions that go to the root of title. If you have an obvious contravention of the Planning Act that renders your title void, well, nothing could be 
more clearly a root of title requisition, but some are a little more in the gray area. I don't think we can make those decisions. Try and submit all your requisitions within your requisition period of time. Don't get involved in playing the game as, oh well, nothing here, or this all goes to the root of title. Uh, I can uh, therefore disregard my requisition date and I'll submit my requisitions in due good time. I'd like to read to you, expanding on this concept of requisitions on title and the requisition date, something that w recently came out in uh, an article of the uh, Real Property section of the bar, uh, the 19, August 1980, What's New and Wonderful section, having to do with zoning violations that must be requisitioned in time. The recent case of Jackson et al. versus Nicholson et al., 25 OR, second edition at page 513, has probably by now sent shockwaves through the real estate lawyers community. All of us know that requisition periods are usually deliberately kept as short as possible and rarely does one obtain replies to municipal zoning inquiries within the required time for submitting requisitions and often even before closing. This case involved the purchase of a house which it turned out had a sunroom added to it by a prior owner. Unfortunately for the purchaser, the addition contravened the municipal zoning bylaw. The agreement of purchase and sale being the standard Toronto Real Estate Board form provided for a 20-day requisition period. And as is often the case, the purchaser solicitor did not receive the survey until almost the expiry of the requisition date but in any event, the survey did not indicate the addition thereon. Through his standard inquiries, the purchaser solicitor was informed by the municipality that the addition to the house was illegal and either had to be demolished or remodeled under a properly authorized building permit. The solicitor then immediately submitted a requisition requiring proof that the building complied with the zoning bylaw, even though the requisition period had expired some 10 days earlier. When no such proof was furnished on closing, the purchaser naturally refused to close, and after the abortive closing, the vendor applied to the Committee of Adjustment, presumably got a minor variance, and promptly sued the purchaser for specific performance. In his judgment, Eberly J. reconfirmed the principles that requisitions as to compliance with zoning bylaws <coughs> do not go to the root of title, nor are matters of conveyancing, and therefore cannot be submitted after expiration of the requisition period and prior to closing. The judge did sympathize with the real estate lawyer's plight and recognized that there was a common practice of mailing a copy of the survey to the municipality and not getting a reply until after the last requisition date. But quote, this is indeed a practical problem, but I'm not persuaded that it should outweigh the language of the contract and the reported decisions which deny purchasers the right to submit zoning compliance requisitions beyond the time limited in the offer. Perhaps a solution is a longer period for requisitions or other changes in the contractual terms." Close quote. As the requisition had not been submitted in time, the judge ruled in favor of the plaintiff vendor. This uh, decision is probably viewed as being harsh by the profession, but we must abide by it for the time being at least. Longer requisition periods should be insisted upon wherever possible, and vendor solicitors should be urged to cooperate by providing surveys immediately after acceptance of the offer. Now perhaps you could protect yourself in some way by adding one of these standard form requisitions to your requisition letter when you haven't got the response. Uh, something as simple as uh, required satisfactory evidence that the uh, buildings have been constructed in accordance with applicable building and zoning bylaws. Uh, my comments in the lecture about the value of standard requisitions, uh, you will see when you have an opportunity to read the lecture, uh, there is uh, obviously standard form requisitions are, are not the optimum, but when you have nothing more to work with, take this as a uh, last shot effort at uh, getting your licks in and getting your client protected. I deal at great length with the form of the requisition letter uh, because 
with the development of case law, it seems that there's almost a ritualistic dance that takes place uh, with submitting requisitions and uh, with the wording of the standard form agreement of purchase and sale. Uh, you see my opening paragraph. It's, it's by no means uh, written in stone. You probably all use something similar to it. We have now completed our investigation of title in connection with the above noted property and submit herewith the following requisitions on title and on a contract without prejudice to our client's rights to make such further and other requisitions as may be required and without prejudice to our client's rights under the terms of the agreement of purchase and sale herein and reserving the rights to waive any or all of such requisitions at any time or times in whole or in part. Well, I've tried to preserve certain rights for myself. I don't know if I've been successful in doing so, but w once again, it's, it's better than not having it in there at all. As I've indicated to you further, if you've had an opportunity uh, to review the agreement of purchase and sale beforehand and make some amendments, and if it turns out it's a sub uh, substantial transaction, uh, that, that goes on something other than the real estate board form, you might want to add in something along the lines of the second quotation, provided that the purchaser's right to make further requisitions on title and submit any objections with respect thereto is reserved in the event any document affecting the property shall have been registered against title subsequent to the time herein limited for the submission of objections or if anything shall have taken place to change or affect materially the vendor's title subsequent to such date and prior to the closing date. On page four, I get into a basic structure of requisition letters. In the workbook, and I'll be referring to some of the workbook materials in a few moments, uh, I've given you some example letters of requisitions just to give you an idea of structure. Uh, I consider the structure very important for myself, once again, thinking back to uh, the ogre of negligence that hangs over us. We need as many checklists as possible. And the requisition letter, if it's complete and thorough as it should be, acts as an additional checklist for you for each transaction. You submit your requisitions. Uh, when I get a response to requisitions, I refer back to my requisition letter and, and actually make penciled notes in the margin uh, beside each requisition to determine whether or not I've been satisfied and what I can expect in response on closing. Uh, I've grouped uh, four basic groups of requisitions. One, requisitions on title after a review of the search and an examination of the survey. Secondly, requisitions on conveyance, and this grouping of requisitions would include the requirement to comply with applicable statutes, such as Planning Act, Income Tax Act, Family Law Reform Act, and under this heading, requisitions concerning outstanding sheriff's executions could be included as well. Once you establish your requisition precedents, it's quite easy for you to uh, dictate your requisition letters. Uh, you should need no further instruction uh, to your secretary other than do the Income Tax Act requisition, do the Planning Act requisition, do the uh, Family Law Reform Act requisition. And what I use as my standard form of requisitions for this type of legislation is uh, required satisfactory evidence that the conveyance herein complies with the provisions of uh, the Family Law Reform Act of Ontario and amendments thereto. Uh, in this regard, we would suggest that the appropriate affidavits be inserted in the deeds to be delivered at the time of closing. Now, that can be your standard requisition. All you do is you change the name of the act, and, and uh, that, that's good for four requisitions. It also helps, as I mentioned before, for your checklist. Requisitions on matters of contract. This grouping of requisitions would deal with matters arising from the agreement of purchase and sale itself, such as the necessity to deliver original leases, assignment of leases, directions to tenants concerning payment of future rentals, indemnity agreements, bills of sale, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, a little bit later on, when we turn to the fact situations, uh, I will indicate to you several examples from the arising from the fact situations. Uh, which would lead to requisitions uh, in your requisition letter. Your last grouping of requisitions could deal with a formal request for a draft deed or transfer statement of adjustments 
matters arising from zoning and building inquiries, outstanding realty taxes, keys, vacant possession on closing. All requisitions should be submitted in a proper and complete form to the standard that they could be incorporated independently in a motion under the Vendors and Purchasers Act. It is rare, of course, that it is necessary to proceed under the Act, but in any event, in any event this should be the standard of your form of requisitions. I don't know how many of you have ever gone on a VNP motion. I think I've done about three in the last nine years, so they, they are quite rare. Uh, if you look to your workbook, uh, or make a note that this part of the lecture to you refer to your workbook at page uh, 233. Uh, this has to do with the lecture that will be delivered to you, uh, I believe, at the next session by Miles O'Reilly, but I, I'll use his materials. Uh, it has to do with a notice of motion um, in a, um, I believe it's a specific performance action. Uh, this is not the V&P motion that I'm mentioning to you, but it's the same concept. The requisition has been lifted from the body of the requisition letter and has made, been made the subject matter in this litigation. Uh, you have on page 233 and page uh, 224, uh, 234, your requisitions are outlined, then your responses are outlined, uh, there's no uh, determination given in this material as to, as to uh, what result this case has. It's obviously some form of, or not obviously, but it could very well be some kind of mythical fact situation. But you see in the responses, uh, for example, uh, the inclusion of Reginald Castles as a plaintiff in the foreclosure action was superfluous, and any claim against the lands would be barred by the doctrine of latches. Well, I, I myself found that uh, answer unacceptable uh, on face because I didn't recall from law school what latches was. And uh, I thought in case anyone asked, I better look it up in, in, in a dictionary. And it turns out that it's something, something less than a, uh, a straight bar under the Limitations Act. Uh, it's basically an undue delay that uh, answers as a response. It's a something less than an absolute bar of limitation, but a considerably long period of, of uh, unresponded to problem. The requisition was lifted. It was dealt with. As I indicate to you, this should be your form. Uh, if you have received the Ontario reports uh, that came to my office uh, this morning, it might be helpful to you uh, once again to uh, see the kind of action that can arise under a vendor and purchaser's motion. Uh, you have Lance versus Jones et al. on uh, page 13, uh, volume 30, second edition. And uh, I won't deal with the case, but once again it gives you some idea of how a requisition has been dealt with, answered. In this case, the, the solicitor uh, obviously went to some considerable difficulty in, in making response to the requisition, and his efforts were rewarded uh, when it, the case was determined in his favor. Uh, some of you may have heard that a uh, vendors and purchasers motion is referred to as a, as a friendly motion. It's a friendly motion in the sense that uh, it's in everyone's interest uh, on occasion that both parties cooperate in proceeding under such a motion. The purchaser that has submitted his requisition and feels that he has received an unsatisfactory response would be quite pleased to be told by a court that in fact the response was satisfactory. He can then take that decision, deposit it on title, and uh, his client hopefully has a marketable title. Uh, in this sense, they are friendly motions. I believe Miles O'Reilly in his lecture next week will be dealing with vendors and purchasers motions at, at some greater length. Uh, but I bring them to your attention because this is our standard for requisitioning.
in every instance requests the best possible answer, and if, for example, there is an encroachment by an abutting owner, you would require production and registration by way of quitclaim deed of the portion of land being encroached upon. You may later choose to accept an encroachment agreement or some form of other declaration, but this will be for your consideration at a later time after you have received the response and have had an opportunity to discuss the response with your client and discuss with him the implications of accepting the response uh, for subsequent resale. You may also consider requisitioning in the alternative. For example, if it appears that a bar of dower or release of dower is missing from title, you may requisition production and registration of a release of dower interest or in the alternative production and registration by way of declaration that the grantor was an unmarried man or widower at the time of the subject conveyance. Once you have made your requisitions in the most complete manner possible and have received your responses, you are then free to consider these responses and discuss them with your client and consider at that time what compromise positions you and your client are prepared to accept. In carrying on these discussions, it is imperative to impress upon your client that your title opinion may, the word is may in the lecture, I think it should be will be subject to certain matters which he has instructed you to accept, and it is suggested that he later review his reporting letter in the event of a subsequent resale so that he can protect himself accordingly. The best rule of thumb, as I've indicated to you, is to requisition everything. Uh, it's always the uh, problem with uh, especially a newly graduated lawyer that he's afraid of being embarrassed, that there's, there's an obvious response to the matter that uh, he knows he's requisitioning and perhaps he shouldn't requisition it. Well, I'd suggest to you that uh, it be incumbent on all of us to swallow our embarrassment and uh, requisition in any event, and then when you receive your response that you're a stupid fool, uh, at least you'll know better for next time. We come to the satisfy yourself type of requisitions. Uh, satisfy yourself is uh, probably uh, the lawyer's favorite form of euphemism. And those of you with some style perhaps preface it with kindly satisfy yourself. Uh, but I, I'd suggest that you make these kind of requisitions even though you know what the response will be. If you haven't made the requisitions and you are then unable to satisfy yourself, you may be out of luck. Your client may be forced to accept a position that he otherwise would not wish to accept and he may blame you for it and he'd be right to do so. At the same time as you're preparing your requisition letters, you should be preparing the same letters to the various municipalities, uh, tax departments, whatever, in an attempt to satisfy yourself. Hopefully by the time the response to your requisition letter comes back uh, with, with this phrase in it, you'll have, you will have satisfied yourself on most responses. I think it's a good rule of thumb not to rely on the other lawyer for anything. Try and do most of it yourself. Whatever you get from him turns out to be a bonus. If you want a declaration of possession, don't ask him for it. Prepare it, submit it with your letter of requisitions, and ask him for it then. You'll find that you'll almost always get it then. You won't get it if you simply ask for it and don't go to the trouble of preparing it yourself. I had the occasion once uh, where a solicitor requested of me um, a declaration of possession and uh, no form came from him and I, I called him or his office the day before uh, closing when my clients were to attend to sign documents where his declaration of possession was so that my clients could review it and if acceptable sign it with the other materials and uh, his uh, secretary told me that, uh, oh, Mr. So-and-so has a practice of requesting declarations, but if it turns out that he has to do them himself, he doesn't bother. Uh, so he has a very efficient way of practicing. I'd suggest that whatever you want, do it yourself and send it with your requisition letters, whether it's declarations, whether it's tenants' acknowledgments. If you know the kind of form you want, 
prepare it, send it, you're likely get it back in that form. Occasionally, you will receive form requisition letters which have been sent off immediately upon receipt of the agreement of purchase and sale without having made a search of title. My inclination is to ignore these, forms of le these form letters until a proper requisition letter comes in. And as I've indicated to you earlier, in my opinion, which I believe is supported by case law, the solicitor has not fulfilled his obligations by submitting form requisitions within the requisition period and relying on these form requisitions, which are later followed after expiry of the requisition period by specific requisitions. If you're forced to do it, do it, but only as a last resort. Just as an aside, I've uh, indicated in the lecture a very brief paragraph number four on the differences between acting for the mortgagee and the purchaser and I always enjoy acting for mortgagees because there's a tremendous sense of power uh, when you have the money and you don't have to preface your introductory letter with uh, polite uh, requisition response. You can simply be very abrupt and say, prior to advancing funds here under, we will require. Uh, power is tremendous. Uh, but think about acting for both purchaser and mortgagee, which you will often do in your residential purchases. You're submitting requisition letters for your purchaser. Your mortgagee is also interested in having a good marketable title. Your purchaser may be prepared to accept or waive certain requisitions. Your mortgagee may not. Uh, keep this in mind. Uh, there is a fine line that we sometimes have to walk before getting involved in a potential conflict of interest situation. In your responses to requisitions, as in the requisition letter itself, the response to the requisition letter should similarly have an opening paragraph which could briefly read as follows. We acknowledge receipt of your letter of requisitions, etc., without admitting the validity of your requisitions. And if this is the case, specifically noting that such requisitions were delivered out of time for the making of requisitions, but merely to assist you, we offer the following, and then proceed. When you respond to the requisitions, once again as a matter of form and checklisting, respond to the requisitions in the same numbers uh, that have been submitted to you in the requisition letter. It makes everything follow much more clearly. If the requisitions have been delivered out of time and you fail to note this occurrence in your response, you may be deemed to have waived this action uh, by the solicitor for the purchaser. Your introductory paragraph as set out above could be further expanded to include the phrase without prejudice to our client's rights under the terms of the agreement of purchase and sale. And the purpose of all this verbiage is to protect both the vendor and purchaser from the clause in the standard form of agreement uh, which uh, leaves over us the specter of rescission of the contract. For the vendor to retain the right to rescind the contract, he must therefore protect himself in the form of responding to requisitions on title. From the purchaser's point of view, you must be aware that when insisting upon an answer to a requisition, you must keep in mind the vendor taking advantage of his right of rescission. Hopefully, certain of these preamble paragraphs described in the lecture would give some protection to either party. I at all times suggest that you attempt as best you can to be sincere in responding to requisitions. Uh, as a good rule of thumb, I suggest that your requisition response should be something that you yourself would or could be satisfied with if you had been in receipt of such a response. It's tempting sometimes to try and float a high and fast one past the other side, but uh, it often explodes in your face, and uh, you'll oft you, you, if you do it with regularity, you'll find that you've developed some kind of reputation, uh, which makes it more difficult uh, to deal with other solicitors in future. As an example of, of, of attempts at sincerity, I was selling a shopping plaza once, uh, which had the land described as uh, approximately 15 acres. 
and it was a rather substantial transaction and the uh, I think 11 page requisition letter was submitted of some 60 odd requisitions uh, one of which indicated that the purchaser's client uh, purchaser's uh, surveyor rather had uh, done some calculations and uh, there was not in fact 15 acres there was 12 acres and uh, what they were requisitioning was 15 acres uh, or in the alternative an abatement of the purchase price by some 20 percent and here following my my own advice I had to attempt to be sincere and suggest uh, to this uh, purchaser that 15 acres more or less was 12 acres and uh, I, I, in fact, suggested to him that it was, and uh, I felt that there was some justification in my doing so uh, because uh, my client wanted to close the deal and because the purchaser was not buying land for development purposes. He was buying a shopping plaza. He was buying, his purchase price was based upon tenant's income. Uh, there was no indication of uh, expansion and examination of the site would have indicated that the shopping plaza had uh, expanded to the full extent of the site in any event. Uh, so when the purchaser had submitted his offer based upon a visual inspection of the premises, uh, in my opinion, his purchase price would not have been based upon acreage. It would have been based upon uh, return. Uh, he may have been entitled to some abatement, but it certainly would not have been a 3 15ths, 20% abatement. Uh, for your information, the transaction of purchase and sale failed to close for some of the other 80 requisitions, but I don't think that one. Uh, when you receive your requisition letter, discuss immediately with your client any requisitions which you appear to be unable to satisfy. Your client may have a reporting letter in his files from a previous solicitor which has in it a declaration of possession. Your client may have a verbal agreement with his neighbor concerning an encroachment which could, which could be embodied in a written encroachment agreement or your client may advise you that he is either not prepared nor able to satisfy a particular requisition and you therefore have to proceed accordingly. When acting for a purchaser having received a response to your letter of requisitions, once again the client must be involved in the process as we hope the process of requisitioning is to ultimately provide your client with a marketable title. Whatever requisition you have outstanding that you feel has not been satisfactorily answered will ultimately affect your client upon resale and once again your client's instructions should be received in writing and your reporting letter qualified accordingly. A suggestion is that any response received to your requisitions which satisfies a title matter should be deposited on title to facilitate the resale procedure and for simple safekeeping of documents. Such matters as declarations of possession, declarations concerning sheriff's executions with similar names, declarations concerning prior estate claims, court orders, uh, should all be deposited or registered on title. No matter how efficient your filing system, these documents are safer in the registry office uh, than within your file. In terms of satisfying requisitions, uh, there are a number of acts available to you which are of great assistance. I've indicated you some of these uh, acts by, as examples. Uh, you should review these acts, familiarize yourself with them. They are often very helpful in responding to requisitions. Uh, there's uh, Section 1, 1.1 of the VNP Act, uh, which is very helpful. Uh, providing that uh, recitals uh, greater than uh, 20 years uh, on title, uncontroverted, are evidence of their truth. Uh, I think you will finally find that you use that as often as any for some of these uh, sticky old requisitions that are impossible to satisfy otherwise. Uh, Conveyancing and Law of Property Act, once again, I'd suggest that you review the legislation. Uh, for example, uh, one of you may have come across a restrictive covenant uh, on title to a cottage property uh, that uh, deals with uh, restriction on uh, sale to persons of certain races, color, or creed. Uh, the 
Conveyancing and Law Property Act will protect you uh, and render such a restrictive covenant inoperative. Uh, once again, the Limitation Act uh, is, is a helpful act in many cases. Uh, Limitations Act, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is something more than latches. Uh, it provides uh, in Section 25, uh, for example, the limitation in, in an action for dower and how you deal with that situation. The Registry Act, uh, hopefully if you're dealing in, in real estate on any kind of regularity, you should be familiar with the provisions of the Registry Act and the Land Titles Act, and a uh, very helpful clause in the Registry Act is the, uh, the clause, which is not at my fingertips, but it's the one that says claims uh, within your chain of title, but greater than 40 years old uh, may not be operative and may not affect your title. Pardon? 1, 10, 11, and 12. Thanks, Mary. Uh, the Municipal Act uh, deals with what constitutes a public highway uh, in one of the sections, and this is often very helpful uh, when you find a title. Uh, where there's been a uh, expropriation, or not an expropriation, there's been uh, perhaps a conveyance to a municipality which appears on the face to be for road widening, but there's no indication in the body of the conveyance that uh, there has been a dedication of these lands for public purposes. The Municipal Act is very helpful for you in, in satisfying this type of requisition. Another, another uh, piece of legislation, the Devolution of Estates Act, uh, is often very helpful when you have estate problems on title and uh, you find that there are apparent gaps in title uh, from one party to, the no to another and the gap can often be explained by a death and a vesting in a beneficiary. Some of the sections of these acts are attached as uh, materials in your workbook. I've indicated to you uh, previously in this lecture that declarations of possession are of great importance. I use them in virtually every transaction, no matter how short or long the period of possession. I, I find even in situations where the uh, title appears clean, uh, I find it of some comfort to have a declaration of possession on file. And the concept of tacking uh, applies if uh, a number of periods of possession can be tacked together, uh, you can bolster up your title. I saw somebody uh, raise the, their eyebrows and said, land titles too? Uh, not really. Uh, as, as most of you know, the concept of possessory title doesn't apply to land titles. I will sometimes use them not for the possessory aspect of the declaration, but for all the other goodies that are in the standard form declaration. Uh, I mentioned in my lecture court applications. I, w I won't go into them at any length of time because Miles O'Reilly will be dealing with uh, court applications and I think his lecture is what to do when the deal doesn't. The other ways of dealing with requisitions, responding to them, the obvious one that gets you off the hook is your client's instructions to waive. Uh, these instructions should be to you in writing, and as I've indicated any number of times, I, I don't think I can say it often enough, confirm it in your report. There is often case law uh, response to various types of requisitioning. Uh, for example, a whole body of law is developed with regard to contraventions under the Planning Act, and an awareness of this law can often satisfy an outstanding requisition. I'd like to turn to some parts of the workbook now. Uh, if we deal with the, uh, some of the fact situations. I'm going to presume for, for some of these comments that the agreement of purchase and sale has actually uh, been written, submitted, and accepted in the form of the fact situation. 
to deal with the kind of problems that arise and should be embodied in your requisition letter. I've tried to stress uh, in my lecture that requisitions are not only requisitions on title, they, they should be the whole transaction uh, dealing with the contract itself. Uh, I'll try not to step on any of your toes, Pat. I think you're doing some of the fact situations at length. But dealing with the um, first fact situation, the rural property, one of the things that comes to mind and is actually referred to in my earlier remarks is the number of days to search title. It is suggested in the fact situation that there are 10 days given to search title. Aside from the fact that this is not a particularly long period of time, especially for rural property, and uh, you would hopefully, if you had had an opportunity to negotiate the agreement or comment on the agreement beforehand, have, ex have extended this period, you will also see that there is a condition in the, peer in the fact situation where the purchaser has 10 days uh, to arrange financing. You have 10 business days to arrange financing, 10 days to search requisitions. You can't wait to find out whether or not your condition on financing is going to be satisfied. If the agreement has been drawn in the manner of this fact situation, you have to search immediately. The agreement might fall to pieces when financing cannot be placed and your client might be put to the expense of paying for your searches but it's a lot better expense than being out of time to requisition. Hopefully, as I say, if you've had an opportunity uh, to examine the agreement beforehand, you will have restructured this part of the agreement so that your requisition period falls after your condition period. You might say, you might even say uh, in the form itself, 10 days from satisfaction of requisition, requisitions or simply give yourself 20 days or, or 25 days so you at least know that there's some period thereafter and until everybody knows that there's a firm deal, nobody's got to go to the effort and extra expense. Some of the things that should jump out at you from the fact situation and should, should be embodied in your requisition letter uh, I'll just comment on them. There's, there's some mention of, of acreage and an, an adjustment of the purchase price based upon acreage. You should be requiring in your requisition letter a solicitor's certificate of acreage. Uh, you're dealing with, with a farm. Uh, there are a number of acts uh, that specifically deal with farms and could create liens uh, against the farm property. Uh, that your client and yourself would be completely unaware of if you do your simple standard uh, search of title. You might uh, want to consider uh, searching for uh, farm tax reductions that have been taken, uh, whether any loans have been taken out under the Farm Loans Act. Uh, these won't necessarily appear on your title, uh, but if it turns out that you're buying a farm uh, certain bells should go off in your head. Be aware of the particular problems and submit requisitions accordingly. Uh, you're buying cattle. Uh, I I don't, I'm not certain if there's specific registers where one searches for cattle, but at the very least, uh, your PPSA searches should be done and, and requisitions accordingly. Uh, once again, you're concerned with, with the farmland. You may be concerned with uh, um, irrigation with water. Uh, there's a mention in the fact situation of municipal drains. Uh, you might want to requisition uh, certain matters de uh, dealing with local improvements. Uh, most of these municipal drains have been financed by way of local improvement charges and uh, your client uh, might be very interested to know that he has many additional expenses that will, will fall upon him. You have an obvious requisition from the fact situation having to do with compliance with the Planning Act and as to whether or not uh, there has been compliance. You have an obvious requisition uh, from the fact situation as to compliance uh, with the uh, requirements of the Conservation Authority and you should be requisitioning that. You will be told to satisfy yourself. 
in your workbooks. I believe you have a listing of addresses for the Conservation Authority and you should be proceeding to satisfy yourself. In the urban fact situation, a number of matters that once again should jump to attention from a review of the fact situation and from and be included in your requisition letter. There's a first mortgage to assume. Uh, an examination of the abstract indicates that there's a first mortgage on title of, uh, of forty thousand dollars. I believe there was an amended fact situation which indicated that he was to assume or the purchaser was to assume an $80,000 mortgage and in fact this $80,000 mortgage might be the $40,000 mortgage on title that was amended and extended. Uh, your first hope is that you did not act for the uh, mortgagee of that $40,000 mortgage who's now perhaps lost uh, his priority for his additional $40,000 advance. Uh, what you should be requisitioning uh, until you know for a fact that that $40,000 mortgage on title is the mortgage that you're assuming, uh, you should be requisitioning production and registration of a proper and valid discharge of the said mortgage. In the event this mortgage is the first mortgage to be assumed under the terms of the agreement of purchase and sale, required amending and extending agreement, uh, amending and extending the terms of the mortgage to be in accordance with the terms of the agreement of purchase and sale and registration of same on title, uh, production and delivery of mortgage statement from mortgagee confirming the mortgage to be in good standing uh, in accordance with its terms. That should be some kind of example as to way that particular requisition should be structured you're buying a new house, Re you should be requisitioning certain specific things uh, with regard to a, a new house purchase. Uh, you may have particular interest as to whether or not an occupancy certificate has been issued by the municipality. Uh, <clears throat> you would have particular interest as to whether or not uh, the builder has been enrolled in HUDAC and uh, you would require his HUDAC enrollment number, perhaps a copy of his deposit uh, receipt, and ultimately the HUDAC warranty for your client. Uh, it, ind it indicates in the fact situation that a single family home is being purchased, and at the same time, uh, our purchaser would like to assume an, an upstairs tenancy uh, this should raise certain bells of alarm and you should be requisitioning uh, a minor variance to the bylaw uh, permitting this additional tenancy. On the tenancy itself, assuming that the agreement of purchase and sale is drawn for you to assume the tenancy, the zoning has been amended accordingly so that the, uh, the tenancy is proper. Uh, you will be requisitioning uh, delivery required uh, delivery on closing of original lease, uh, assignment of lease, uh, direction to tenant to pay future rentals to the purchaser or as the purchaser may otherwise direct, and perhaps if you can get away with it, an acknowledgement from the tenant uh, confirming uh, the tenancy to be in good standing and unamended in accordance with its terms. That's dealing with the fact situations.